Okay, thank you. And yeah, if we could get those. Great. Um, hi, my name is Ron Schwartz, and um, I'm going to tell you a story today. It's a true story. Uh, it's a story about my father, uh, who was born in Germany. And the story is about what it was like for him growing up as a Jew in Germany, uh, what his experience was, uh, and how he survived the war, and, and what he went through. Um, in, when you hear about speakers, people that talk about the Holocaust, so this is my father's story. It was his experience. It, he is referred to as he would be first generation, and people would talk about him as a 1G. Me being the son of a survivor, I'm second generation, I'm a 2G. And sometimes when, if someone is speaking about the Holocaust, people will say, oh, you know, who's speaking? Is it a 1G or a 2G? Okay, and just a little bit of vernacular. Uh, also, I may use some words today. It, if, you, if I say anything and you don't know what that word means, just put your hand up and I will tell you. Um, just a, a little bit of background, uh, just about the war. Um, about, actually no one really knows how many people died during World War II. The, uh, the estimates are all over the place best I could find is about 70 million people died. But, and let's break those down. About 20 million of those people died from just war-related disease and famine. In fact, uh, Stalin literally starved to death 3 million Ukrainians just on his own. Another 20 million were military combatants. Those are actually soldiers that put on uniforms. So that's 40 out of the 70, that leaves 30. Another 24 million people were just untargeted casualties. Maybe people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, when tanks and, and, and armies rolled through countries. Uh, maybe people that were killed in bombings, when the Germans bombed England, when the Allies bombed, obviously a lot of bombing during World War II. That's 64 million people out of the 70. The other six million were Jews. Weren't in the wrong place at the wrong time. Weren't um, untargeted. They were specifically targeted and, uh, as you've learned, just murdered. Most of them in camps like um, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka. Um, others just, you know, in pogroms, people, you know, lined up in front of a ditch and just shot and then, um, you know, just buried in the ditch. In fact, just actually a couple of weeks ago in Belarus, the country of Belarus, they were um, excavating to build an apartment complex and they found a mass grave of Jews that had been murdered during the war uh, that they didn't know about. Okay, um, my father's story. So, my father, as I said, he was born in Germany in 1926. He was born in a town called Ludwigshafen. Ludwigshafen is about 60 miles from Frankfurt, which is the biggest city in Germany. When my grandmother was in the hospital giving birth to my father, um, so my grandparents owned a jewelry store in Ludwigshafen. When my grandmother was in the hospital giving birth to my father, the, um, somebody broke into the jewelry store to rob it and murdered my grandfather. Can't imagine what it was like for my grandmother to get that news, having just given birth to her son. Um, but anyway, three years later, my grandmother remarried to a man named Oscar. Oscar adopted my father and is the, um, obviously the only father that my father ever knew. Um, this, Pick this on the left, this is the um, marriage certificate. I actually have the original document of my grandmother to Oscar. The document on the right is my grandmother's birth certificate. That's also an original document. This second picture, that's a picture of my father as a boy. I don't really know how old he is, 12 maybe, 10. And this picture is just uh, a picture of um, a storefront in Ludwigshafen. Um, life was pretty normal um, in the 20s in Germany. Um, 
This is also Ludwig's often. You can, the, um, the picture on the left is the synagogue in Ludwig's Uh That's the outside of the synagogue. And um, on the right, that's the, uh, the inside of the synagogue. But things, things started um, changing a bit um, when things got not so normal. And let's listen to my father talk a little bit about some of the anti-Semitism that he experienced in school. In the, uh, I don't know about the first year, but certainly in the second, third year, and beyond that, uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the school. In other words, uh, the kids called me uh, Sau Jude, which is German for Jew Pig. Uh, and I remember that the teacher really didn't take any action. I mean, he was not openly uh, antagonistic towards me, but he certainly made no attempt whatsoever to curb uh, the other children. So some of this that he's talking about is actually even before Hitler came to power. Just there were negative feelings and anti-Semitic feelings in Germany. Um, obviously, it got a lot worse when Hitler did come to power, which was in 1933. And Hitler, in 1933, he gets named chance, appointed Chancellor of Germany. And I think what's important to note about it is that Hitler did not come to power through any kind of military coup or takeover. He came to power through purely legal and legitimate means. Now, it's almost impossible to understand how he got this power without knowing the, the economic state that Germany was in in 1933. Now, there are entire courses in college taught just about Germany in the 20 years between World War I and II. I'm going to kind of give you a two-minute summary of this, what was happening in Germany. Um, the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, signed in 1919, put a lot of restrictions on Germany. They had to pay, they, they had to accept responsibility for World War I as the bad guys, and they had to pay something like $31 billion in reparations, which is the equivalent of about $450, $500 billion today. Money that they didn't have. Um, what they tried to do to get to deal with this economic burden, they tried um, to increase social spending. They introduced modernization projects of like utilities, and they just didn't have the money. There were um, tax revenues are declining. Um, there's a lot of unemployment, and Germany's just falling in, in the 20s in, into an economic tailspin. Um, the U.S. the depression hits in 1929. It was not just in the U.S. It was a worldwide depression. The U.S. had lent Germany money. The U.S. is in a depression. They want their money back. So they're putting pressure on Germany to pay back the loans that it had made uh, to Germany. Uh, also, money that, that Germany didn't have. So all they could do was print currency. And they printed, printed, printed currency. That devalues the currency. Inflation's going is rampant. There were stories of people sitting in restaurants ordering meals. The prices are changing on the menu while they're sitting there eating. And we talked about the, um, the inflation and unemployment. So in comes Hitler. And Hitler does two things. The first thing he does is he needs a scapegoat. And he blames the Jews. The Jews control a disproportionate amount of income and wealth in Germany. A lot of them did have jobs. A lot of them, like my grandparents, they were, they were sh small shop owners and merchants. Okay? So they were a really easy scapegoat. And Hitler said, Look at these people, look what they have, and they're the reason that you don't have anything because they have it all. Okay? So a really easy target. 
And then his other plan was to eliminate unemployment by he was going to beef up the military, tons of military spending, and give everybody a job. And he did really accomplish both of those. About uh, two and a half years later, after Hitler comes to power, the Nuremberg Laws get passed. Um, the Nuremberg Laws were um, laws for the, the protection of German blood and honor. And it defined who was a German and who wasn't a German. Jews were not Germans. They did not have pure German blood, according to the Nazis. Um, these laws imposed a lot of um, restrictions on Jews in Germany. For example, it was illegal for a German woman uh, to work in a Jewish home. So my father had a nanny that took care of him while my grandparents were at work at the jewelry store. She wasn't Jewish. They had to fire her. My father talked about what a tear, he, he loved her, what a tearful, you know, um, goodbye that was. There was a citizenship law that said Jews are not Germans. It took away their citizenships, citizenship and said you are not citizens of this country anymore. You are now stateless. Okay? And it defined who could be a German citizen. Um, they also had Jews, um, you can see in the top uh, that center slide there, uh, Jewish, businesses had, Jewish businesses had to identify themselves by painting a yellow star on their storefronts with the word Yuda, which means Jew, which told everybody we are a Jewish business and obviously a lot of people stayed away from those stores. They didn't want to be seen doing business with, with Jewish people. Um, so these, Jew, these laws had a crippling effect on, on Jews in Germany. And just one other thing I want to point out here. This is an article uh, from the New York Times from 1935. Berlin works out anti-Jewish rules. And the reason I put that in there is I think it's important to note that this wasn't, this was happening in Germany, but it wasn't just the Germans that knew about this. This had, this is the New York Times. There's worldwide knowledge that this is happening. People knew. Um, let's listen to my father talk a little bit about the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, in the meantime, uh, additional uh, the Greece came out limiting the movement of Jews, for instance. Uh, I recall we couldn't go uh, anymore to the park where we used to go because the benches in the park had signs. Uh, no Jews uh, are allowed. Uh, it was difficult to travel because hotels had signs. Uh, no dogs and no Jews. Uh, as a side uh, comment, uh, after World War II, <coughs> uh, the Germans liked to go to the uh, shore in Holland, and since the Dutch had uh, suffered quite a bit under the German occupation, the hotels on the shore in Holland had signs, no talks and no Germans. <laughs> Um. You tell my father loved that little story. He uh, used to tell me that when I was a kid, and he would always laugh and giggle just like he did there. Um, in 1938, about three years after the Nuremberg Laws, Kristallnacht happens. Kristallnacht, it's two words put together in German. Kristall means like uh, shards of glass. Nacht means night. You put it together, it's the night of the broken glass. The reason uh, it is called this is what happened was that um, throughout Germany, civilians and soldiers plundered and pillaged Jewish homes and stores. They broke shop windows of Jewish businesses, right? They were all identified with yellow stars. They broke in, they trashed the places, they stole merchandise, they broke into uh, apartments and houses of Jewish homes, broke down the doors, 
trashed the furniture. Uh, they also burned all the synagogues down in Germany. So that synagogue I showed you a couple of slides ago, this is the same synagogue. This is a picture taken after Kristallnacht. This is the outside. You can see the smoke coming out, and that's the inside. Synagogue completely, completely destroyed. Um, down here, an article, front page of the Dallas Morning News from 1938. Hysterical Nazis wreck thousands of Jewish shops, burn synagogues in wild orgy of looting and terror. So again, there's international knowledge. The whole world knows what's happening in Germany. Uh, let's listen to my father talk a little bit about Kristallnacht. We were spared uh, uh, and they never uh, came to our apartment, nor did they destroy the store, and uh, they told my parents later on that since uh, we had a jewelry store and there was a lot of gold in there, that they considered that to be state property and therefore it was not their intention of uh, destroying it. Uh, they beat up my dad and uh, for, a long, for several days, um, uh, we didn't really know where he had been sent to. Uh, my mother went to the Gestapo office uh, every day to find out uh, what the status was. And I gather they were, uh, they were civil to her. Uh, and she finally found out that uh, he had been sent so my grandfather gets arrested during Kristallnacht. About 50,000 Germans were arrested over the course of those two days and sent to concentration camps. Now, this is 1938. The concentration camps are not quite what they became later in the war. Uh, they are now, at this point in time, they're essentially political prisons okay, for people that were opposed to the Nazis or for people that the Nazis considered to be undesirable. Okay. So he gets sent to Dachau and I guess Kristallnacht really confirmed for Germans that, and for German Jews, that Germany was not a safe place to be. Uh, a lot of parents were trying to then, working hard to get their kids to safety to get them out of Germany. They wanted to get out themselves and save themselves but they wanted to save the children first. Um, it was arranged for my father to go to France, to Paris. Uh, he came home from school one day, and his parents told him that tomorrow he was getting on a train, and he was going to Paris. He was going alone. They were not going with him. And um, can't, he was 13 years old. He didn't speak French. He'd never been out of the country. Um, I can't imagine what it was like for him, but let's listen to him talk a little bit about leaving Germany. 13, 1939, uh, I was taken to the railroad station and with a group of uh, 100, maybe 200 kids, uh, we took the train for Paris. Uh, when we got to Paris originally, uh, we were sent to the Rothschild Hospital because apparently they had uh, enough uh, rooms and beds available to accommodate everybody. And there we were. Uh, sorted out uh, and sent to various children hostels. Uh, I was sent to a place called Chateau de la Guette, which was about 50 miles east of Paris. Uh, it was, oh, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was owned by the Rothschilds, 
or that they had rented it, but we were 136 kids, uh, all from Germany and, and Austria. Uh, we were very well taken care of there. In other words, we uh, had nice accommodations. Uh, on, um, we were adequately fed. Uh, Do you think he was scared? Yeah. yeah. Y'all are 15 or sitting 16. Just imagine two, three years ago, you come home from school and you're given this news that you're leaving the country by yourself. You don't know, you don't know if you're going to survive. You don't know if your parents are going to survive. You don't know if you're ever going to see your parents again. Okay? And you don't even speak the language of the place that you're going. So, um, you know, he talks about this very matter-of-factly, but I can't imagine you know, what, what this was like for him. So he gets to La Guette. Uh, these are actually a couple of pictures on the left of my father at La Guette. Uh, this woman in the top, she was actually a teacher at La Guette and could have been my father's teacher. And um, spoiler alert, everybody, all the La Guette kids survived the war. And this is a picture of a reunion that they had in the 1980s. My father couldn't make it, but they did send him a picture. Um, at La Guette, he pretty much was in school all day. Uh, half the day was dedicated to learning French. The other half of the day was the you know, traditional subjects, math, science, and, um, and history. Um, so it's May of 1939. Uh, my father stays at La Guette, and then he gets, there were too many kids at La Guette, so they sent a bunch of kids to another school, uh, to a, a different boarding school, and in 1940, in May of 1940, Hitler and Germany invade France. Uh, when they invaded France at first, if you look at that map, I don't know, can you see that white line in the map? France is divided into two zones. The northern part of France is occupied by Germany. The southern part, under that white line, is um, the unoccupied zone, uh, referred to as Vichy France. Uh, my father's at this boarding school. The director of this boarding school decides, eh, with the Germans kind of at the doorstep of Paris, we don't want to be here. This isn't safe for the kids. So he owned an estate in a town called Poitiers, which is down here. And he decides to evacuate the entire school to his estate. Um, it's chaotic leaving. Here's a picture of a train platform, right? Nobody wanted to stay in Paris with the Germans about to occupy the city. And so just very chaotic leaving. Takes the kids to, um, to Poitiers. And the problem with Poitiers is that Poitiers was still in the occupied part of France. They stayed there a short time, decided, well, this really isn't any different than being in Paris or any safer than being in Paris. So then he took the kids back to, um, to Paris. But let's listen to my father talk about leaving, leaving Paris and the train ride to Poitiers. The director of the school, or the owner of the school, uh, owned a uh, uh, an estate uh, near Poitiers, uh, which is a sort of halfway between Paris and Bordeaux. Uh, and uh, we, when the Germans were basically at the doors of Paris, he decided to evacuate the whole school to Poitiers. And uh, we took the train. Uh, from Paris to Poitiers, it, it was quite an experience because everybody was fleeing and uh, uh, the, 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 the trains were sort of 
crowded. I mean, there was barely room to stand, and they were slow. Uh, but we finally made it. <coughs> so everybody wants to leave, right? Nobody wants to stay in Paris. So Paris to Poitiers, they go back to Paris, and then he gets sent to a town called La Broboule, to a place called Hotel des Anglais. He, I think, has a little bit of class there, but um, is mostly working as a cooking in the kitchen and um, peeling potatoes and, and, and doing dishes. Uh, La Broboule, <clears throat> it's actually a very nice town today if you're ever in France, but La Broboule is in the um, unoccupied portion of France, so a lot more desirable to be there. Obviously, a lot of people wanted to flee occupied France for unoccupied France. Do you think the Germans made it easy? No, they didn't. Uh, my father has no idea how they got the papers and permits to do it, or if they even had papers and permits, but they made the journey. But a lot of people tried to do this. A lot of people were shot trying to cross um, or shot at. Not my father and his group, but, um, but people were. I mean, this was a, a, a risky journey. Uh, they get to La Broboule, it's the winter, and um, life is tough there. Um, the war is on, and let's listen to my father talk a little bit about, um, about his, his time in La Broboule. It was a very harsh uh, winter for us. Uh, our food was severely rationed, uh, and the things that were not rationed, and just uh, like the vegetables, just were not available. Uh, then uh, it was very cold and snowy. Uh, lots of snow, very cold in winter, and uh, there wasn't enough coal or wood to heat the place. Uh, we had minimal heating in the dining room and in the uh, bedroom and in the um, classrooms. We had zero heat uh, in the bedrooms, and of course we were constantly hungry. There was uh, there just wasn't enough to eat. One of the people uh, in we were all um, five or six uh, in each bedroom. Uh, one of the people in our room was a very uh, tall and strong guy, and uh, I remember he once went. Uh, during the day, in, uh, in the evening rather, into the mountains and into one of the barns, and he stole a 50 pound, 50 kilo bag of uh, oats that uh, were kept there to feed the horses, and he brought it back, and we were eating the oats. Uh, which were horse uh, meal, and I remember I had a shoebox, and I filled that with oats, and I kept it under my bed. Horse meal, they ate horse meal. Okay, there just wasn't enough food in France, and I guess you did, right, what you had to do. Uh, by the end of 1942, uh, Fran uh, France is now, all of France is occupied by Germany. There's no more um, unoccupied and occupied zone, and it was decided that none of these Jewish kids were safe anywhere in France, and they had to get them out to Switzerland. They were going to help them escape to Switzerland. Switzerland was a neutral country. They were not in the war, and so they would be safe there. So um, my father and three friends with fake papers in hand get on the train to travel to a town called Anmas. Anmas is in France, but it's on the border with Switzerland. It's about three and a half miles from Geneva 
Geneva is one of the biggest cities in Switzerland. Um, there were controls everywhere. On the train, you constantly had to show your papers. When they got off the train in en masse, you couldn't get out of the station without, um, uh, without showing your papers. They, had, uh, they were met at the train station by what my father called a guide. The guide took them to a safe house where they hid out till about 2 or 3 in the morning. Uh, and then he took them to the border. Um, they cut through some barbed wire. They took off their shoes and socks. They waded across a little river. And they were now in Switzerland. Um, so I'm going to tell you what happened in Switzerland, but I first want you to think about how terrifying this journey to en masse must have been. Uh, if they got caught, they'd either be shot or sent to Auschwitz. Um, in order also, in order to cross the border into Switzerland, they had to understand the German border patrols. They had to know where the Germans patrol were patrolling and when. So there was a lot of, not, this was not, um, this was not an easy journey for them. So uh, now they're in Switzerland. They start walking. They're heading towards Geneva. Geneva, and they get picked up by a Swiss border guard. Uh, I'm going to let my father tell you about that. Just keep in mind, there are four of them. Three of them are 16 years old, including my dad. One of them is 15 years old. Now uh, we took off. Uh, our shoes and socks and put up our pants and we got across the dark wire and uh, that little river and on the other hand we sat down we put back our shoes and socks and at that point uh, the, uh, that we were already in Switzerland back then, the other side of the river of Switzerland at that point uh, we were caught by a Swiss border guard. Uh, and I said there were four of us. Uh, uh, he took us to a sort of entry post uh, where we announced our names and date of birth. We had nothing on us. In other words, no baggage. I mean, just the clothes that we were wearing. We had zero money, neither French nor Swiss. Uh, we had no papers whatsoever. So whatever information we gave them, they had to accept at face value. Uh, uh, they asked for our date of birth, and uh, three of us were, were born in 25 or 26 and one was born in 1927, and uh, they announced that they would not keep uh, children over the age of 16, and the boss asked one of the border guards to take us back to the border and to ship us back across the border into France. <coughs> uh, they kept the fourth one, who was born in 1927, uh, when we, I mean, he took us back to the border. Uh, turn over the so he took us back to the border and he said, uh, this is France across the uh, little river, uh, and uh, you need to go back. Uh, Geneva is in this direction, and I don't know what you're going to do when I'm on my way back. So we waited till he uh, uh, had come back, and then we headed towards Geneva. I mean, can you imagine hearing this? They get all the way to en masse, they get into Switzerland, and then they're told, you got to go back to France. Going back to France meant almost certain capture by the Germans. And then, the fluke of getting this border guard who let them stay. Uh, the border guard, by the way, um, I always wanted to find out who he was, but I couldn't. Um, uh, so he did this really decent thing. There were a lot of people during the war 
that did decent things. We call them upstanders, okay? And so this soldier was an example of a, a fine upstander. So they hike into Geneva. Uh, they had the name and address of a pastor that they knew had helped refugee children. They show up there. Uh, he gave them breakfast. My father said they, had, they couldn't believe, they, they had no idea there was that much food anywhere in the world. They were, they were really hungry in France. Uh, the pastor told them to go to the police station, tell them you're 15 years old, and he told them where the police station was, and he gave them money to, um, to take the tram. Uh, just one thing I want to add about this hike from the border into Geneva. It's three and a half miles. It's the winter. It's cold. It's snowy. These are the Swiss Alps. They're steep mountains. They're rugged mountains. This was tough. This is not the sound of music, okay? Has anyone seen the sound of music? No? Okay. It was a joke, so <laughs> see the movie and then you'll get it. Uh, the police take them to uh, uh, a refugee camp. Um, wasn't luxurious, but uh, there were straw beds to sleep on. There was food there. They were being fed. And my father uh, basically moved around Switzerland. I mean, he's safe in Switzerland. He's, like, his life is safe. He knows he's not going to be captured by the Nazis. But his life wasn't easy. He, he's a refugee in Switzerland. He's not a citizen. Uh, there are a lot of rules and restrictions that are placed on him. Uh, he moves around from children's home to children's home. He was probably in four or five children's homes. Uh, during his, uh, he was in Switzerland for about three years. And um, here's actually an example. This is an original document on the left, an English translation on the right. Just he, just some of the rules and regulations. He, he couldn't leave the city without permission. Uh, he had a curfew of 10 a.m., uh, 10 p.m. Uh, he couldn't visit any bars, dancing halls, or gambling halls. He had a restraint from political meetings. There was a whole set of rules and regulations that, uh, that he had to abide by. And he didn't have any money. And so when he needed something, he had to write to the police and ask for money. Uh, so this is actually, on the left, an original letter uh, of him asking for money for something. Uh, that's the English translation on the right. I actually have a lot of these letters where he asked for money for, for clothes or eyeglasses. And uh, these are actual copies of invoices that he submitted with his letter um, asking for money. So again, he's safe in Switzerland, but his life there um, wasn't easy. Um, the war ends in 1945. Um, my grandparents, by the way, managed to escape Germany a couple of months after my dad. They go to England. So this whole time my father is in France and Switzerland. His parents are in London. And um, the war ends in 1945. My father is now 19 years old. He hasn't seen his parents since he was 13 in six years. And you would think the first thing he would do would be to go to England and reunite with his parents. But he didn't. He went to Palestine, to which it was not yet Israel. It didn't become Israel until 1948. And he worked on a kibbutz for nine months. Um, kibbutz is kind of, at the time, an agricultural commune where you couldn't own anything. This one grew oranges. And uh, he worked. They gave you. Uh, a place to sleep. They fed you. They gave you clothes to wear. But there was no money. In fact, his parents sent him postage stamps so he could write them letters, and the kibbutz confiscated them. They said, this is the property of the, the kibbutz. You're not allowed to own anything. It was a real, very socialist mentality. My father absolutely hated it. Um, this is actually, I know you can't really see this, this is the actual ship manifest of my father's journey from uh, France to Palestine, and I know you can't see that, but between those two red lines is his name. Um, so he, 
he's in Israel, he stays there for about nine months, and then he, um, I'm not ready for that one, he goes to, um, he does go to England to reunite with his parents. It's now 1946, and um, goes to London. Uh, he lives with his parents, they have an apartment there, and he spends about two years in London uh, learning English. He didn't speak English at the time, and uh, just having odd jobs. And the plan was always, always, always to come to America. This, in their view, was the land of opportunity. Uh, the streets were paved in gold, gold here. So he stayed for two years till 1948. And in 1948, he came to America. He sailed from Liverpool, Liverpool to New York. And again, I know you can't read that, but that's actually the ship manifest. That's my father's name where the, the red arrow is, October of 48. He comes to New York. He gets an apartment in New York City. And then after he got settled, his parents came over and um, joined him in New York. Um, the, oh, um, in 1952, my father became a citizen of the US. That's his naturalization card. And the rest is history. My, you know, they, he comes here in 48. He meets my mother in 1951. They get married like three months after they meet. My brother is born almost exactly nine months after they got married. You can do the math on that and try to figure that out. Um, and I was born a couple of years after my brother. These are just some pictures of what the family became. Um, these are my kids. I think they're two years old here. They're now 30 years old. Uh, this is my father holding my newborn son. That's a picture of me at, when I was 13 at my bar mitzvah. And that's a picture of um, my father and I. Uh, feels like a long time ago. And that was a picture of my uh, father's cousin who, um, who lived in Israel. Um, I know we're kind of at the end here. Just a couple final thoughts. Um, you know, you all are in high school. You went through junior high, high school. You're probably going to go to college, maybe graduate school. This experience of hiding in France and then being a refugee in Switzerland, that was my father's school. That was his experience. Okay. Um, also, I want to tell you that despite, my father came here and had a great life. He made a great life for himself. He made a great life for his family. And despite the adversity that he went through and this incredibly traumatic experience, it really turned out for him. And I think we should acknowledge that, all of us, and that when things get tough, because we all face adversity in our lives, when things get tough, um, be hopeful. Things turn around. Things get better. So I know we're done. So thank you very much.